before we move on to missing middle, uh, I just would like, Ellen, your name has been invoked uh, in terms of maybe knowing more about the history of taking, removing um, in one of the drafts, removing the community wastewater system. Could you educate us a little bit about this issue perhaps? No. Um, I guess I would just add, so the, can you, can you be more specific? What community, the, the, what section are you talking about? Um, section 2A, I think. Um, oh, 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 from the, from the neighborhood, the neighbor, the designated neighborhood development area requirement. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, and you wanted to know what? <laughs> Why Jumping it was between why, why so <laughs> it's hard. I, I just wanted to understand. Peter mentioned you being involved in some meetings around this, and uh, I, I just wanted to understand what's going on. My understanding is that it's that in five eleven, the stakeholders got together and they saw this as an impediment to housing development and. Uh, so I'm just trying to understand why it may have been part of the requirements for designation and what's the ramifications potentially of taking it out. Senator, I was in, I was in those discussions as well. Okay. And it, it's simply a technical correction. It's simply that um, those, you're gonna need a permit to have any sort of wastewater um, Location. I mean, we as a group, I believe Ellen was on some of these, the um, Regina, um, uh, the uh, Bennington Regional Planning Commission Executive Director and others debated this over and over, whether we should just leave the language, because then it people wouldn't feel like we're taking away a requirement to have a permitted wastewater system, or just take it all out, because the problem is alternative system has a definition. And in some locales, folks may um, have a wastewater solution in a neighborhood development area that isn't technically a, an alternative system and that still may work and they'll still have to get a permit so that calling out those specific elements serve no purpose because of course you're going to have to have a permitted system in order to put new housing units in it. So it's not really meant to, I think, give people this much pause put it back in, leave it out, it, it, the end result is the same. You're gonna need permits to, in order to build housing units in those areas. But I, I thought the way I was reading as a lay person is I thought that the permits you would need uh, under existing law to have the designation had to be sort of congregate or community based and taking it out, does that allow a it, development where every home has its own wastewater system? It really wouldn't work in most situations, but there may be a double lot that you can expand the number of units by having a, a shared system and certain it's just giving more options to meet the required wastewater requirements of any housing development in a dense area. Um, if you want more technical, I think the folks that were debating whether to leave as is or just take this out because it it, it tells you a bunch of options, but doesn't give the full story and why the sort of policy folks suggest to just take it out because it, it wasn't really serving uh, as much of a purpose. Um, I, I'm not an expert in this area. Just I remember those conversations clearly. Um, it, sounds like they it sounds like they were painful. <laughs> I, I would just add uh, respectfully, I disagree with what the commissioner just said. I, I don't think this could be considered a technical correction in any way. This is setting the requirements for what a neighborhood does a neighborhood would need to be designated under the state requirements. So this is what the municipality needs to demonstrate they have before they can get that requirement, uh, uh, before they can get their designation. Having the designation then opens up um, these areas for incentives. Yes, development in general requires a permit for wastewater regardless. This is requiring that the municipality demonstrate up front that there is already infrastructure in place whether that be municipal infrastructure or an alternative system. Um, so it's demonstrating that this area already has infrastructure for wastewater in place before they receive 
uh, the designation and therefore the incentives. And that's exactly the point that this may be looked at as, oh, we don't have those. So never mind. We're not going to pursue this designation and go through the planning that will ultimately require them to get a system that meets a permit. And so if you, you know, it could be looked at as a disincentive to pursue the designation because we don't already have this in place. And so this was the planner debate. Well, take it out because once they get the designation in order to incur that development, they're going to have to get an approved system to make it all work. And so it was looked at as a, a first stop barrier. Um, and the conversations I was on, no one in the sort of planning world was feeling like we were giving away permits or encouraging less development in these areas. It was simply uh, giving people um a chance to pursue this designation without feeling like they already needed to have um, systems in place that they would need to put in place before housing could be built. Because, you know, the requirements of the designation area all speak about more dense development in very rural areas that don't have it. Um, so it, it, it's, it's really not, I, I think, as big of put it back in, take it out. I think the the community debated this. And I think I was one that said, if we take this out, it's going to be perceived as we got rid of a bunch of um, requirements for building that that's not the case here. And so if it sows confusion, I don't think it's helpful. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. But that was not exactly what I, I, it was related to what I was saying, but this is about the requirements on the town. So yes, permits will be needed for wastewater. Um, If the town doesn't have the infrastructure in place as is required under this designation currently. Moving forward, if you remove that requirement, yes, development that is added will need to get a permit from ANR. But this is removing the requirement on the town. And I do think, yes, that it is currently a barrier to towns getting it because the infrastructure may not be in place in all of these towns currently. So that is part of the discussion as well. These are the requirements that the town needs to demonstrate to get the designation. Okay, it sounds like uh, it's a it's a certainly an interesting argument, and it doesn't seem like the advocates for taking it out care that much about taking it out. Um, so we'll have a committee discussion and make a decision. That's why we get paid the big bucks. <laughs> so uh, anyhow. Um, Let's move on to missing middle. Um, uh, I want to start off with let's. Oh no, I, I'm sorry. We have Graham Campbell here from JFO uh, to give us a brief update on his projections on um, uh, on uh, the removal of sales and use tax on building materials for PHP products. Graham, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Senator. For the record, my name is Graham Campbell. I work at the the Joint Fiscal Office and I was asked by uh, Senator Sorokin to look into um, a sales tax exemption on building materials for housing project or for priority housing projects. Um, I worked with Pat Titterton in our office to look at this. And I also want to uh, quickly say thank you to uh, Chris Cochran, Jen Holler, and uh, Kathy Byer, who helped me a lot on this estimate. Um, I always like doing housing stuff because the the group is so helpful um, in this world. So um, more or less, I'll get right to the point. We estimate that this would reduce sales tax revenues by $1.25 million in fiscal year 23, if enacted in fiscal year uh, 23. And then growing to about 1.75 to two million dollars uh, per year, um, beginning in fiscal year 24. Um, because this is the sales tax, it impacts the education fund um, solely. And uh, 1.25 million dollars is under half a penny, uh, roughly, on the um, average homestead tax uh, rate. Um, I want to emphasize that this estimate was based upon information provided by by Chris and um, Jen, and the, but it is, I guess what I would say is subject to a lot of uncertainty um, to the extent that uh, we see a lot more priority housing projects getting built. Um, 
it doesn't take it doesn't take much to make this estimate larger or smaller is what I would say. So um, based upon the figures that I have, more or less for every average uh, priority housing project that gets built, an average one that we estimate um, would cost the would cost the Ed Fund and sales tax about two hundred thousand dollars. So it doesn't take many more. So if, if we add, you know, three, four additional priority housing projects above this estimate, you're talking an extra eight hundred thousand dollars or so. So um, also be less than that. This is sort of our our best guess estimate. So, um, mm-hmm. but I want to sort of give the committee our sense of the the level of uncertainty that this would have. Um, so I guess yeah, but- wrap it up. Yeah, couple couple of questions. Um, in terms of implementation, is there anything magical or uh, unusual that you know how an individual builder going into Lowe's and buying stuff is that a tried and true thing to get the exemption and to track it? And uh, I understand like nonprofits probably go in and don't have sales tax imposed on building materials they buy. Uh, Is there any complication in uh, that regard? Uh, With with respect to just this exemption, uh, I don't think this exemption creates any more complexity with respect to the sales tax on building materials. I think uh, sales taxes paid on building materials in general is sort of a complex area. As you mentioned, you know, if a contractor goes into Lowe's and buys supplies, he's, they are more, they are almost certain to pay the sales tax on that. Um, but if a contractor is working, you know, directly with someone, um, because the contractor is the, the final sale in that case. Um, but if they are sort of buying and then, you know, handing it off, or if they're a distributor of sorts, then the sales tax gets paid there. So I would say, I don't think I am prepared enough to speak to this committee exactly how the sales tax applies to every case in building materials. Um, But I can say that that's a a somewhat complicated area of sales tax law, Um, but I don't think it's complicated by this exemption. I think that's another factor, as you mentioned, the nonprofit, aspect of this is an area that does create additional uncertainty here. Um, Nonprofits generally are exempt from the sales tax. However, it's my understanding, speaking with the advocates in this area, that sometimes the the nonprofit, while they're sort of overseeing the project, it's actually built by sort of a private developer of sorts. And so they would be subject to the sales tax. So to to the extent that nonprofits do actually are, you know, hiring their own crews and building, then they would be exempt. But if they are sort of contracting out with a private entity, then, then they would pay sales tax. And so um, sort of trying to shave out those types of builds from this estimate was something that we tried to do, but it's, it's, I guess, subject to a lot of uncertainty. Um, But that is something that we accounted for is that sort of relationship. Did you um, do you know enough to um, give us an estimate of what percentage savings there would be on the cost of an overall project by eliminating the sales and use tax on building supplies? On an average project? Um, well, I, on a pro- project, how, how does the 6% saving on building building? I guess what percentage of a typical project is building supplies? I mean, are we saving 1% of the cost of the project? Are we saving 3% of the cost of the project? Yeah, so um, it's it's a little difficult to, to know exactly, but generally what I've been told is about half of the cost of a, pro- of a total development cost is construction materials. Okay. And so you're, you're saving for, an, for a median project on based on the data that I have, the sort of sales tax savings is about $200,000 on materials. And so I can't tell you exactly what that is based upon the data I have because I haven't inflated, I've inflated the cost of construction material, but not the total cost of development. So this data I have is from 2017 roughly. And so it's hard to say exactly what share, but it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, two to 4% of total development costs um, is what you'd be saving. Okay. I get a little nervous 
in this area because I remember getting involved. I think I think it had something to do with current use where you bought like ATVs and stuff and whether you were using it for planting or recreation and it all you know wound up being decided at the point of sale and someone got a certificate or didn't get a certificate and something that seems so uncomplicated became very complicated very quickly so um, yeah yeah and I, I do think I don't you might want to have the tax department in to talk about potentially if there's any administration issues here but typically how this would work is that the the entity that would be building the, the priority housing project would issue would fill out an exemption certificate given printed off from, from the tax department and give it to the seller that they're buying the materials from and the seller collects those and in the event that they are audited by the tax department they have those exemption certificates available um, and so uh, that's how I would imagine this would work and I don't imagine it would require any sort of additional administration costs on the part of the Department of Taxes. Okay, great. Senator Brock. And Graham, can you tell us what's the total amount of project cost that this would apply to, estimated? So uh, I've been told by advocates in this area that construction co material costs, for the, so the, the amount of costs is subject to this exam, it's about 50% of total development cost. But I mean, total dollars is what I'm talking about that we would spend in this area that this particular uh, exemption might apply to. And that includes project labor, everything else. Oh, so um, if, we, yeah, if we're, so based upon my estimate, it's about, we're estimating about 20 to $25 million worth of materials would be spent. So the total amount of development, if we're assuming that 50% rule would be in sort of the 40 to $50 million range of. of so you but, the, the 25 million would be, would be the cost uh, on which a sales tax would be based. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, that's correct. And so on that, let's say 25 million, you've got uh, potential savings of, I think you said somewhere between two and 4%. Is that correct? On the on the just the construction side, you would have a total savings of six percent, and then yep. it's about I'm guessing two to four percent on the said total. About yeah. Two to four percent on the total, and the, yeah. the total is twenty five million, or is the total is the twenty five million the actual uh, cost of materials? It's the cost of materials. So the right. total so would be that case probably six percent of that. Then is that right? Yes, that's correct, and right. so that's why I'm saying like I. I don't know exactly. I'm guessing it's somewhere in the two to four percent range. It would depend by project, but mm -hmm. if I'm assuming about twenty to twenty-five million in construction costs and fifty percent of the cost total cost of development is construction costs, then we're talking about forty to fifty million of total development. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one one point two five million of fifty is, you know, a two-ish percent. Okay. So. Okay, so if you assume, though, the savings uh, that you would get as a result of that, is it reasonable to assume that you would be able with the same amount of money to build more things like housing, which is what we're trying to do? Uh, I, I mean, the numbers I'm saying right now are just an aggregate. And so I don't it really depends upon the size of the project. Um, when I say size of the project, I mean the size, the total amount of development costs. So um you know, we're estimating that on an av or a median project based upon the data. So if the building that's happened in the past continues as it's happened, or it's, like it's going to continue, we're going to get sort of unit housing projects in sort of the 20 to 25 unit range. Mm -hmm. um, then you're talking about $200,000 worth of, of tax savings. Based upon my calculations, the median cost per unit on the historical data that it has is about 131,000. So another way to put this is that you may be able to construct one extra unit, but I don't think that's how developers would, I don't know if that's how they would use this money. They might just, it might just be sort of a, it might be applied to some other way or just might reduce the amount of debt that they'd have to take on. I don't know exactly, but you're talking about $200,000 worth on a median project. Um, and so whether they were, 
whether they use that to construct an extra unit of housing, I, I don't know. So I guess is it reasonable to assume that if it costs less to build, there would be at least some likelihood that you might build more? Uh, well, it, again, it depends on the project. So, you know, I, in the data that I have, some projects have a per unit cost that's significantly lower than others. So um, for projects that are very large, they benefit from economies of scale. And so if you're constructing a very large, expensive housing project with a very low per unit cost, mm -hmm. it's plausible that you would be able to take the, your sales tax saving and plow that back into an addition into additional housing. However, if you're building something like a housing development with, you know, 10 or less units, your per unit cost might actually be quite high. And so, you know, it might not be as, as uh, there might not be enough sales tax savings there to make you be able to build or have the money to build more additional housing. And but so- it's but, reasonable to assume that if the cost is higher, you're spending more on materials, aren't you? Yes, but on a, I guess what I'm, I don't disagree with anything you're saying. I'm going to, I'm going to throw you a lifeline on this one. I don't think you're really the, in the builder's mentality to know what they're going to do with the savings. And exactly. Also, That's what I mean. also sort of Brock, it's a great segue into the next segment. Oh, We're talking segue. About, no, it's a great segue because any savings that you have by not paying the sales tax is going to lower the construction costs, which means they're going to get less money in the value gap that we're going to talk about. So either way, it's coming out of the state's pocket uh, and it probably will wash out one for the other uh, in terms of uh, missing middle. So it's a good segue. So I, I, and we're running out of time. So I hope we can uh, just uh, move on. And Graham, thank you very much. 1.25 million is the figure we have to, to we would have to talk to the our money committees about. Okay, thank you. Um, That's just for this year. Yes. Um, so let's move on. I, Josh is here. Josh, I love the <laughs> your label says number one Josh Hanford. Do you know that? <laughs> no. <laughs> you're, the, you're, the, you're the big boss, big, <laughs> job, big boss man. Um, so. Let's just start off by having you in uh, three or five minutes just explain to us the governor's proposal on missing middle. Sure. Um, you know, we, we started this actually two, two sessions ago with a, a really um, even more basic concept calling it the home builder program, which was a up to $50,000 proposal to subsidize the building of homes, modest homes, um, literally uh, provided to a, a builder that was going to commit to build homes below a certain price point. Um, and um, here we are now following up on a federal, the basics of a federal proposal, which was in the Build Back Better program to subsidize um, costs of, of construction and target affordability. Um, and, you know, the governor has been seeing the need on this for some time, seeing yeah. the stats of the construction starts and the building permits just drop off in this area. We're just not seeing homes built um, in this price range in Vermont um, at nearly the level we need to. And so, you know, our, our goal was to propose um, supporting this, but realizing it needs to work its way through um, all the folks that are actually going to access these funds, put them to use, leverage it for the construction loans and the mortgages that need to be taken out by folks. It was a small part of that larger discussion with um, only a few principles that are sort of like the uh, lines in the sand from our perspective was obviously an upper income on the affordability of the households that should participate. We were following the federal uh, guideline of 140% of AMI. Um, there's been discussions now about maybe bringing that down to a cap of 120. Um, but our top line was 140% AMI. And then um, looking at what someone in those price ranges could afford, you were getting at different home prices across the state. And the delivery method for, for, for homes um, coming online across the state, whether that's new construction or purchase rehab of old buildings, 
um, is quite varied. You have some very sophisticated developers and nonprofit partners in, in Chittenden County and some other parts of the state that those um, models don't work as well. So we, the other red line here in the sand is that this needs to be something that works across the state to address the needs and have some different points of entry for folks that want to participate. Um, and, and so that that's where we are now. Those, those are the were the only parameters um, seeing that VHFA was the main partner here, being the largest affordable housing lender in the state. Someone that offers, uh, you know, first time um, mortgages and, and does construction loans. Um, so they were our partner to work with to develop this proposal out and sort of build upon the Build Back Better um, neighborhood um tax credit. Um, you know, we were really hopeful that that was going to pass earlier and give us a launching point. And we wanted to be ahead of the game, knowing that that program at the federal level would take you know, a year or so to roll out and try to get something up and going before then uh, to to really work out the kinks and, and have this benefit from now and a fusion of a, a stable tax credit program. The tax credit program would have required VHFA to establish a new qualified allocation plan, just like they do with the rental low-income housing tax credits, public participation, set affordability limits, all these standards of a public process that they have to go through. And so um, we were trying to mirror what those um, guardrails were of that program. And that's the, the first program we delivered and we've been talking about for a couple months now. Um, since then, there's been a lot more efforts to, you know, maybe um, target more perpetual affordability and things like that that weren't in the federal tax credit program. Those weren't conditions of that. We've said all along that the program we were rolling out could be utilized by folks that wanted to do shared equity and perpetual affordability. It would be a new source of income of, of capital to help those projects go. Um, just like the state tax credit is now, just like in some cases, new market tax credits can be. This would be a new source to fill in gaps, um, but not meant to restrict um, access to the program to only work in a shared equity housing model. Um, so that's where we are at this point. We're working with VHFA and, and Champlain Housing Trust and others to talk about what the different uh, elements of this could be that, that could work for everyone, could work statewide in different markets, um, and we could be successful on and still meet the, the overall goals of supporting the production of a, as many modest homes we can get to market, because it, it, it really is about some, some scale here and actually making some um, progress in the severe shortage of homes in this area that, that we are experiencing in Vermont. So, um, you know, happy to try to answer questions and drill deeper, but I think, you know, we have, um, you know, both VHFA and, and Chairman Housing Trust on here that have been involved in these discussions and, and have some maybe more of the detailed mechanics that, that you might want to dive into. So in the bill, I noticed that there's language that this money can be used for rehab and acquisition. Is that, are those words loosely put in there? I thought this was all new construction. Nope, that was always in there. Um, it's always been in the federal program um, by design uh, with examples we give because they're easier to characterize and people to understand have always been about it costs $400,000 to build a new home on average in Vermont, the bank uh, construction loan uh, appraised value appraisal is only going to give you 375. So there's a value gap in the construction. And then to get that $400,000 home um, that we just, uh, you know, allowed a contractor to build because they were only able to get a, a bank loan for 375. Now that home needs to sell for 340 in order to be um, uh, affordable to uh, a family in Chittenden County that makes 120% of AMI. And so now we need to, to subsidize another $60,000 to bring that home down. We've always used that example because it's it's more standard and, and, and understandable. The purchase rehabs are all, all over the place. You, know, you can buy a home in Barry City that's falling down for $60,000. You can buy homes in Richford, Vermont for $50,000, but they're going to need a varying degree of rehab to bring them back up to a marketable condition. And that could be $100,000. It could be $200,000 of rehab. It just varies. So it's too hard to sort of give those examples, but it's always been part of the program. Okay. But 
I, I guess when I look at the VHIP program and the revolving loan program that's yet to be launched, it seems like we got. It seems like we got a program for everything, uh, and now we're starting an, another program for rehab. Uh, it, it's very different than those others. I mean, this okay, would be a, a sure. So I'm a builder. Let's say I have a crew of 15, and you know, I I do. I, I might see this program as a way for me to buy three or four of those dilapidated homes and you name it X and put my crews to work on them. I took the risk. I bought them. I'm investing hundred thousand dollars of rehab. And now I'm going to make those available to sell, sell as affordable homes for Vermonters. It, it's very different. It's, it's driven by the, um, the industry, the builders, the contractors, the developers, and not a homeowner. The, the million dollar revolving loan fund is the homeowner qualifies for a mortgage on a, mm -hmm. one of these same homes, but they're not going to get the mortgage because there's too many deficiencies in the home inspection. And so we're giving them a grant loan, uh, you know, to uh, commit to making those repairs so that the mortgage could go forward. It's a very, it's one's driven from the, the owner and one's driven from the developer perspective. And the, and the VHIP program is yet different in the sense that it's a landlord tenant situation. And it's this, only for rental properties. So this person, this builder is not going to, you're assuming that he's going to renovate it under this program and sell it as opposed to rent it out. Yeah, this program is only for home ownership, missing middle home ownership development pilot program. And, and the development is rehabbed or new construction but it's homeowner with a upper limit of the homeowners that are eligible to then benefit from those homes and this investment. Okay. And the, so that, that does explain the rehab element. I think the word acquisition is in there as well. Can, can, are we starting a new program to, uh, to just to purchase those homes that in order to do the work on them, someone's got to acquire them. You know, acquisition in our world has a very clear definition for federal funds. And sometimes acquisition has, um, you know, you, you can, you can acquire things and then someone else is actually owning it in a short period. So acquisition is just, just a way to gain ownership of that property so that you can do the, the necessary work on it. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Senator Clarkson. Thanks, Josh. Uh, it's always good to hear about these time and time again. And by you know the time you've done it three times, we actually get it uh, like a good sermon. Um, missing middle. We just had a presentation from Gus and Jen this morning, and in their presentation, they talk about the home ownership development risk pool program. How that struck us as similar to the missing middle program. So I'd like it you to discuss, if you could, the differences and how we're how we could build in permanent, you know, if they're building in permanent affordability, how could we do that here as yeah. well? It, it is the same program. They were the first funders in. Um, they have a lot of ARPA money to support um, uh, rental and home ownership. They had a set aside uh, for an innovation fund. And this program, um, VHFA applied to VHCB to get it started. And VHCB committed $2 million to share in the construction risk pool, um, which is another part of this program that we've talked about. You know, um, folks, contractors, builders, developers, in order to get more construction loans to build these homes, um, if we can um, uh, make banks take more risk because speculative building, um, even though there's a hot housing market, it, it's not, um, there's a lot of uh, risk involved in that. And a lot of banks are, you know, the interest rates are either, high, either higher or they're only giving them a portion uh, of what they need for a construction loan. So what VHCB has done is supported this missing middle homeownership development pilot. The exact concept we presented in the beginning with an initial $2 million grant to help VHFA um, um, support the construction lending that's going to be needed as part of this um, program. And the uh, risk pool that, that they've supported, uh, I, I could be wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure um, doesn't necessarily come with perpetual affordability on that risk pool. It's to help more builders access construction loans to build more homes that are in this missing middle period. The funding that they're supporting 
is an add-in risk. There's no way to track that money to an end user down the road. Um, and I'm sure um, Mora could, could chat more about that or Jen, mm -hmm. but it's, it's supporting this very concept as we've laid it out since the beginning. So why aren't we just putting more money into that program as a term? In, yeah. As a, creating it, a missing middle it, program. It doesn't have this ability to do all the other things we want, which I believe you do too, that, you know, the sort of ensuring that that subsidy can carry forward and help reduce that cost of time uh, over time. It, it, it doesn't, it, you know, folks to build need to access capital to build. Then we are trying to subsidize the costs to allow affordable homes to move in. There's multiple layers in that process. And this is one of the areas that when VHFA started talking about um, how to make a, this pilot successful, they heard loud and clear from banks and from large construction companies that they needed um, access to more construction loan dollars. Banks were not willing to take the same risks that they took a decade ago, and this would help free up more capital to make it happen. And so it's a small part of this overall uh, so, pilot. And it's, it's not going to solve the other problems we want to throw $50 million into sort of some sort of construction lending that we don't have the same oversight on. Maybe, I mean, it, we only have 10 more minutes, but Maura is with us and she probably knows the details of this better than anybody. Uh, it sounds to me from a lay perspective that this is sort of getting at the value gap in loan form rather than grant form. But Maura, you've heard this discussion. I'm sure you've got a couple of comments. Hi, good morning. Good morning, Maura Collins with Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Um, and Commissioner Hanford laid it out very well as did Gus earlier this morning. I was listening in um, that Yes, and, and when I had testified earlier, I had spoken that there were three components to this missing middle proposal, the first of which I glossed over quickly for your committee, and that's probably why it didn't land and really resonate, is because we weren't asking you all for money for it, and so it didn't feel appropriate to go into details about what we were doing um, with VHCB, but uh, we did apply through the innovation fund that VHCB set up to um, to ask for $2 million for this use, as was um, described. This was an idea that it was the state's builders and bankers came up with um, to make housing more affordable. And um, it's going to backstop the construction loan. It does not cover the value gap. It has, there's no, the way it's set up looks at 15% of the construction loan uh, and that is how much we can backstop with this loan support. Um, and so it's a totally different calculation than looking at the total development cost. Um, and I understand that it is complicated and, um, but that is the nature of home buying it and home building, especially it also does, um, this program through VHCB that was funded is not a separate program than what we're talking about today. It's just three components of one program. It'll be marketed together. The rules will be the same. In fact, if you all, if I'm going to be brutally honest, if you all decide not to fund the uh, value gap and affordability gap and the rest of this program, then we would likely turn to VHCB and say, we will not be drawing on the $2 million because that 2 million was always designed to be in partnership with this other funding where we would build out, as Josh explained, a comprehensive program plan that describes the type of eligible homes, their size, their affordability, the uh, uh, profit limits and all that. This other, th this complementary funding that we're talking about today was always designed to work with this money from VHCB and be one program. We just went to Two different sources to fund the one program. So what, what do you mean by back stop? And do you have $2 million sitting in a, an account as like a surety or something? Or do you give out that money at any time? How, do, how does that work? 
In talking with the state's bankers, they um, said that different bankers had different preferences of how they'd like us to structure this. And so we are um, still working through if we're going to allow a menu of options or if we are going to pick one option and go with it. But the choices right now are that um, VHFA could hold on to the $2 million and should there be a loan loss in the construction loan, then we would cover that loan loss up to, again, 15% of the loan amount. Um, we would have rules about what would qualify as um, a loan loss and that this isn't just that the builder wants more money or that the banker does or anything like that. That would be, um, there would be some uh, assurances there about what would trigger a loan loss. Um, another model is that, um, the, the, uh, we could actually deposit money with that lender and that lender would use some of the funds we've deposited in that bank to uh, be the money that the builder receives. And that would lower the cost of the construction loan because um, the, they're using this money as part of the loan. And then that gets repaid at the end uh, when the construction loan closes out. Or there could just be... Um, uh, the same kind of VHFA holds the money and uh, the bu builder knows, I'm sorry, the builder has to put up less upfront capital uh, because all builders have to put in equity at the start of construction loans. So there's a couple different models that we are working through. And like I said, we haven't yet decided if all three options are gonna be available in each situation, or if there's a reason that we should pick one option and have that be the program. A lot of that really decides on the elements of the larger program that we're talking about today, which is what qualifies as a missing middle home, how much subsidy is there and the like. So some of these decisions we can't really get out ahead of and make yet until we know what this program fully looks like. Okay, Senator Clarkson. So, uh, Maura, you, you talked about the, the three components. There's the VHCB component, there's our component. What's the third? Well, your component is uh, split into two. It's the value gap and the affordability gap. There's been broad-based support for covering the value gap. The affordability gap um, has been a conversation that I think right. is one reason why CHT is here to speak to. Got it. Thanks. I, I, I sort of thought of those as we were covering. That was sort of one, but. So, I, so, uh, yep. Can I just make one more thing just to make sure it's perfectly clear is that um, while VHCB has not imposed a special permanent affordability, meaning that these homeownership units must be um, below a certain income level, they know about this discussion that we're having here. And they know that permanent affordability will be a part of this broader program. And I think are relying on that. In addition, in this state, we really do define permanent, um, a, a permanent subsidy as a revolving loan fund where the money will get paid back and then another home is assisted. That is very common with the homeownership tax credit program, uh, actually with the mobile home replacement program, sometimes it comes into play. Um, so I think that VHCB would say that being a revolving loan fund that continually is helping more and more homes protects the public subsidy because it doesn't diminish that subsidy. Um, the only time that would get diminished is frankly, if we had to draw on it because there, um, cause the loan didn't perform. Would you, if this, uh, missing middle program goes through, would you, see a need to continue the $2 million program? Yes, because that is how, that's another way we're making housing more affordable by having the construction loan be cheaper. And so for those homes that are built through the missing middle program, they would be the only ones who have access to this construction loan program funded through VHCB. Doesn't the, the value gap grant lower the amount of the construction loan you need to take out? The value gap um, will lower the total development cost, but there's still, um, you could save $15,000 on a construction loan. And so that would lower that total development cost, but it may not lower it to the point where the home will appraise at. 
it, okay. give one, you know, one example we heard, you know, a, a big builder like Snyder Braverman, you know, for them to launch one of their development proposals, they've got $2 million in the bank to guarantee performance and, and that they, they're good for their loan. Others don't have that. This rent, this uh, construction risk pool that we're developing will help others be able to access these loans and get projects underway. Um, you know, banks are very risk adverse to doing, you know, building like this. Um, lots can go wrong between when they start the project and delivering it on time, on budget, and getting people into those homes. And this is a way to help the, the market um, build more homes. It, it, it's it's not a, a giveaway. It's it's not. It works in conjunction with, and it's um, it's a, it's a tool that's used in lots of different areas. You know, we do it all the time through Vita, and whether yeah. it's in the ag industry or everywhere else, where we're putting a little bit of a risk guarantee into a loan pool to help make more lending. We're familiar with that from our days in finance on CUDs. That's what they do there. Um, so I just want to. We've had a bunch of offline conversations about perpetual affordability. I, I don't know if there, uh, there's two sides to that equation as far as I'm concerned. The, the dollar amount that's preserved in the home, but also subsequent buyers, do they, are there any requirements on subsequent buyers uh, in terms of their income levels and, and that kind of thing? And whether there's any way to address that the way it's addressed in, I guess, all other forms of perpetual affordability in the state of Vermont, or is the second and third home buyer, even though the cost of the home is lessened by whatever amount, uh, able to be a cash buyer that just walks in that has a lot of money and says, I want to take advantage of this subsidy that was given a long time ago. And is there any way to control that in a practical fashion? So just uh, we should what are our thinking caps on that as well. Senator Clarkson. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I had a 12 o'clock with the pro tem that right. quickly uh, pulled together meeting on another issue that I need okay. to scoot to. Well, we're, we're going to finish up now. I apologize. But stay tuned. Uh, we're talking about this housing and mostly housing for the next two days to see if we can get this bill out. Uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you for your patience, Chris. Jen, Michael, never got to you, uh, but we'll figure it out. It's that time of year. I apologize. Um, a lot to be decided.